So this is the final presentation I've got in my Miller feedback series. And uh, in the last couple ones, the first one I talked about what was Miller. The second one has talked about how to neutralize the Miller effect. And in this one, I dive a little bit deeper into a uh, negative feedback uh, amp amp amplifier. Because what I found, there was not a lot of information about how a negative feedback amplifier actually works. How do you calculate the gain? I couldn't get a lot of information. There's a lot of stuff you can get around transistors, but uh, transistor feedback amplifiers, but not a lot of MOS, MOSFET feedback amplifiers. And if you go to even EMF R, RD, the, um, the section there where he talks about feedback amplifiers is quite superficial and he gives this big giant equation which uh, you know try and understand that i uh, can't do it so uh, i come from the school of thought thinking there's got to be a simple way of doing things so as all as always just uh take whatever i say with a grain of salt you know i'm no expert on this stuff i use this i do these presentations because it forces me to go and learn a subject i i knew nothing about miller effect Prior to this, I knew nothing about, you know, negative feedback amp amplifiers. So this kind of forced me to go and learn a little something about it. But so it's not really a tutorial. I'm not an expert. I'm not an engineer here. It's just uh, it's just what I learned. So right or wrong. And uh, here's some references I used. I show this with every slide, every presentation. And just uh, just just to recap. The, the Miller um, effect is that we got you get this Miller plateau here coming from the intrinsic uh, uh, capacitors that, that are between the gate and the drain and the, the gate and the source of the uh, uh, transistor. And that causes, you know, the, uh, the rising edge, the, uh, the turn on characteristics of the MOSFET to be delayed because you have to let that uh, uh, gate to drain intrinsic uh, capacitor discharge and then charge again. And that causes that uh, um, little plateau there. And then you, this, I, I found this on uh, the internet. This I don't think this is meant to be Miller, but I'm just kind of trying to illustrate uh, what could happen here. And you could see at the rising edge here, you could see you're getting a little bit of a distortion there and this could be because of Miller. And uh, now if you were to look at this, put this through a spectrum analyzer, that notch there would generate all kinds of nasty higher frequency uh, components. So in the last presentation, I gave you some various uh, options in terms of how to neutralize the uh, Miller effect. Today, I'm going to uh, I did talk about the cascode uh, amplifiers, and I did talk about negative feedback in the last presentation. So here I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into the uh, negative feedback amp. So I'm going to provide you with three models where you could uh, analyze a negative feedback amp. The first one is my simplified model. And uh, second one and third one I'm just going to briefly talk about. I'm not going to go into detail about it is that if you go to a lot of the university techs and university courses, they talk about a feedback amplifier. And I'll just talk a little bit about, about that. And then the one that I found most intriguing was signal flowcharts and Mason, uh, Mason gain formula. That's a very, very interesting. I did not go into it, but I'm just going to just introduce it and spend like a minute talking about it. So what are the goals? What am I trying to do here um, with these calculations? The first thing is that you need to get the maximum gain of uh, the, amp the amplifier. And you need to, to get that to do Miller calculations. And that's really called the mid-band an analysis. So if you were to plot the gain and frequency of an amplifier, you'd get something like this, where you've got a uh, high-pass filter and a low pass filter here. The high pass nature of the amplifier comes from a lot from the um, the DC blocking caps 
that does a lot of the low end uh, cutoff. But you get a sweet spot here in the middle, that's called a mid band, and that's where you get the maximum gain. And then you get the roll off here, and uh, that's um, for the amplifiers. Uh, uh, you know, we work work with that'll be typically because of the Miller effect. Now it could be because of transformers, just design, tank circuits, all that kind of stuff. But what I'm looking at is just uh, the effect of Miller on on that. So next thing is where's the cutoff point? And when I say the cutoff point, I'm not really interested in the low frequency corner here, the low frequency cutoff point. I want to know what the high frequency cutoff point here, the uh, minus 3D point, 3 dB point here. So I'll show how that calculation is done. And then finally, it's uh, how do we know? OK, so we built this amplifier. We said, OK, I need to know the gain at, say, 20 megahertz. I'm going to run a 20 megahertz signal through this amp amplifier. What gain can I expect? So I've got a, a, a very rough way of calculating what that uh, uh, gain will be. So, so let's first of all start looking at the mid-band um, analysis. That's the maximum um, the maximum gain that amplifier will have, and it's typically at low frequencies. So I, you know, this. This this whole process has been very painful for me because I run across all kinds of problems. And uh, are you guys still there? You can hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, you know, I started out doing calculations and LT spice simulations, and I built an amplifier, and I fed in 400, you know, millivolts peak, and I, you know, I was trying to analyze what was going on, and I was looking at the the, the calculations, and it just wasn't working. And I started to scratch my head, and I literally spent weeks trying to figure out what was wrong. It turned out that there was a couple of things. One is if you have any distortion in your signal, the RMS values, which is, you know, that's what I've been primarily working with is the RMS values. Because in, in the DC world, you, you deal with DC voltages, currents. In the AC world, you work with... Uh, uh, RMS uh, values. So if it's distorted, you get a flat topping that skews the RMS value. And then all of a sudden, your calculations won't, won't make sense. Then next thing is, you know, is that, you know, you got to be careful that if you have a DC offset, you know, that's going to change your RMS uh, values. And I'm sure Michael you know, has uh, painful memories of uh, one weekend at Eric's cottage when we, you know, we sat down, we we're trying to figure out what the RMS value of a square sure wave do. is. Sure do. Off. Yeah. So, you know, this came back, Michael, this came back and bit me here again. So, <laughs> you know, and uh, the, the final thing was that, you know, yeah, it's all fine and good to use RMS currents provided everything is in phase. Once things are out of phase, you can't really use RMS because RMS is a scalar. It's not giving you the phase of, of uh, the signal because the uh, two RMS values could add or uh, could cancel each other out if they're 180 degrees out of phase. So Dave, did that's you, another. Did you go back to uh, not, not sharing? Not what? Not sharing. Are you still sharing? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we oh, see something it. Wrong here. I'll yeah, sign out and come back in. Okay. Okay. So just to illustrate to you the pain I went through, these are all the calculations. I went and I tried calculating things, didn't work, and I'd go back. And this this notebook is completely full of just sample calculations, trying different things, trying to figure out how all this stuff works. And it took me a long, long time to figure this, this stuff out. And one of the outcomes, and one of the things later on, and I, this is going to be something I, I, I'm going to keep referring back to, is how do we make RF measurements? And, you know, I got bitten with this big time later on. You'll, you'll, you'll see why I got bitten. 
but it's something I think maybe as a general outcome from this presentation is that maybe we should have a round table or we should do something around making RF measurements. And I, I, I think Peter, your, you know, your, um, uh, your probe that you're working on, your act, active probe is probably some something that we desperately need because I think I got bitten by this in many ways and uh, some some stupidity as well. But just from a very, very high level, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in the math going through the, this stuff, but you have to do something. You have to work with something called an AC model. And when you build your AC model, there's a couple of things you have to do. First thing at AC, you ground all DC sources. So if you look here, any of the DC sources, they get grounded because an AC signal goes right through it. And the fact that I've got, you know, capacitors here, they also short out any AC signal. So this 10K here would get shorted to ground. This 500 ohm resistor here gets shorted to ground. So your, your AC model, the first thing you do is you short all your uh, DC power supplies to, to ground. This is an AC power supply here, V4, is an AC power supply, so that doesn't get shorted. Then you short all DC blocking caps. So those are the, typically the larger caps, like the 10 mics, you know, 100 nanofarads. Those ones, they're just basically a, a short, an AC short. So this C3, 100 nanofarads, you know, that's a short here. C5, another 100 nanofarad, that's a short. This C13, that's another short. That's a 100 nanofarad. And by the way, this C13 here is just put in as a DC blocker. So this feedback uh, resistor will not change the bias point of the transistor. And then finally, you replace the BJT or MOSFET with the equivalent small signal model. And in the case of a MOSFET, it's a, it's a current source that's driven by the voltage, the VIN at, at the gate, the vo gate voltage and a function of the transconductance. So if you look, RB gets shorted to ground. So there's RB shorted to ground. Uh, RF remains between the gate and the uh, drain. Uh, uh, R10, which is RD, I, I mislabeled. Some of these are labeled R10 and RD here, but that's the same resistor there. That gets shorted to ground. R7, which is RL here, that gets shorted to, to ground. So with that, you now you could start doing your analysis. And so what I did, I looked at this from a current perspective. I looked at summing the currents. I'm not going to go through the cal calculation here, but if you go through and you calculate this and you do some clever things, you know, uh, you can come up with the gain of this formula here, which is a function of the feedback resistor, the transconductance of the uh, transistor and the drain and load resistors here. So that what, that's what drives uh, the gate. Now, this equation is only valid for this type of amplifier here. So if you try and apply this to a, like a, a BJT amp amplifier that doesn't have feedback, it's not gonna work. Okay, so how does this, this compare? So what I did as a first step, I took this model ran it through LT Spice, and I generated a spreadsheet with all the calculations of all the various nodes and currents, and I put down all the currents here, and I used this to kind of uh, work out whether the math was working. And so the way this is, you've got different columns. Each column is for a different value of the feedback resistor. So this column here is for an RF of 100 ohms, this column 200 ohms, uh, 500 ohms RF, so we're talking about R2, the feedback of R2, here it is for 750. So, so here I blew up the uh, calculation, the, the comparison between the calculated gain and what LT Spice spits out. And so here's the, the comparison at 100 ohms feedback resistor. Here it is at 200, blah, blah, blah. Here it is at uh, 2000. So if you look, uh, one's negative, one's positive, ignore that. LT Spice has given me a absolute value of gain. It's an inverting amplifier. It's supposed to be negative. So just ignore the sign. But if you take a look, it, it uh, tracks pretty well. 
you know, so it's, I think it's good enough. The, the calculation, this equation seems to work with LT spice quite well. So if you look at calculating the input impedance, there are two ways of doing it. The first way is that you keep the R, the, this bias resistor, RB is the bias resistor. And so same thing, you do, you sum the currents and you do some clever math and you come up with this equation here and Z in is a function of the RB, the bias resistor, the feedback resistor, and this R0, which is just a parallel combination of these two resistors. I was too lazy to write them out, so R0 is just a RD in parallel with RL. So now if we look at the second way of doing it, so in the case of RN or, or ZN, typically it's much smaller than this uh, 10K resistor. So in, in all intents and purposes, we could remove it and we could calculate ZN without that resistor there. So if, if we do that calculation, we come up with this formula here, which is just a function of your feedback resistor RF and R0 and the transconductance uh, of the amplifier. And once again, R0 is just a parallel combination of RD and RL. So how does that compare now to LT spice? And once again, same thing. This is just all the calculations for each of the different feedback resistance R2 here. And so here's the uh, calculation for with RB in the uh, uh, equation. And here RB is removed off. And if you compare the values, they track pretty good down at 100 ohms feedback resistance. It seems to be off a little bit, but hey, not too bad for a first level of, um, approximation. So now is that out? Uh, and so this was something that I struggled with for months, you know, how to calculate Z out. If you look at the textbooks and the, you know, the uh, uh, university training courses and all the college courses, everything online, they say you basically to calculate your Z out. So this is the output impedance here is you need to short the input of uh, the amplifier. So you short it. So in that case, you short the amplifier. When you short the amplifier, this RB goes away. So all that's left is just RF in parallel with R0, which is just a parallel combination of RD, RL. So this is your equation. It's R, um, for the open beans, RF in parallel with RD and RL. So how does that compare with LT spice? Hey, it comes out almost bang on, like, to one decimal place. It's like bang on. So not too bad. Now, the challenge I had here was this has got 50 ohm resistor here. That's a source impedance of your source coming in. Now, in my mind, if you're looking at the output impedance, okay, you want to include this 50 ohms. You don't short it here. But when I do that and I short it here, all hell breaks loose and I cannot calculate Z out. I cannot do it. If I use it with LT spice and you'll see, uh, no, no, it's not here, but I'll have in some of my calculations, I'll have uh, LT spice R out with RS in 50 ohms in place or with it uh, shorted out. And I, I couldn't make that work. I couldn't get that to work and I just gave up. So uh, let's look at the feedback amplifier. So that, that was my simplified model of how I just derived equations. And I call that my simplified model. Let's look at what the textbooks and the training courses tell you what, what to, to do. I call this the egghead model. Sorry to the engineers that are on the call. But so basically the way that this is supposed to work is that you have your amplifier and you're taking some of the output and you're feeding it back to the input of the amplifier. And this is only appropriate for negative feedback amplifiers. So here at the front, you're sampling, you're taking either current or you're taking voltage. You're taking a sample of the voltage or you're taking a sample of the current and you're feeding a proportional, uh, um, 
a portion of that back to the uh, system here, which is a mixer, and you're either going to be adding a voltage or you're going to be adding current. And so they have different types of amplifier topologies. There's a voltage series, voltage sump, voltage series, blah, blah, blah. In terms of the amplifier, I have been looking at, it's called a voltage shunt. And if you look at what the feedback, this feedback amplifier analysis looks, this is how it should behave, which is, in fact, the way that it is uh, behaving. So according to the equations, this is how you would calculate the closed loop gain. Now, there's closed, the open loop gain, gain is where you don't have feedback. That's called open loop. There's no clo there's no closed loop. The closed loop gain is where you have a closed loop going back around. So the closed loop gain is with the feedback going back. It's saying you take your your uh, open loop gain A, so no feedback, the maximum, the mid width, mid band gain A, right? And you divide that by one plus the gain times this beta, which is the proportional feedback you're putting back. And so your gain will be decreased, your input resistance will be decreased, and the output resistance will be uh, de decreased as well. Well, it doesn't work quite as simple as that because these amplifiers, to do the analysis, you got you to gotta convert them to a trans-resistance amplifier. And all of a sudden, when you're dealing with a trans-resistance amplifier, the gain is a resistance. You're looking at the gain as the voltage being fed in at the uh, 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 input of the amplifier and the current that's coming out at, uh, of uh, the output. And so the voltage divided by current, which is a resistance, that is called your gain. And so when they're talking about open loop, closed loop gain, they're talking about that. I could not get this to work with that amplifier because most of the examples they have are for BJTs and uh, I couldn't find any amplifiers for a MOSFET with feedback amplifier like the one I had. I just could not make this work. Finally, I just had to give up and move on. This was very, very, very interesting. This is uh, the signal flow charts and the Mason gain formula and I stumbled across this as was searching, trying to understand, you know, how to analyze these uh, negative feedback uh, amplifiers. And I stumble across this article here from this uh, professor uh, from Georgia Tech, and he has this uh, paper he put out, and it's basically for his class. For his, it's like a set of notes for uh, one of his classes, and it talks about using this. Um, uh, signal flow flow charts and basically you take your amplifier and you uh, you construct an AC model and you do this thing called a signal flow graph and and there's lots of uh, videos on how to do this it's quite complex but it's pretty cool I, I gotta admit and so basically in a nut nutshell you're taking this AC model you generate and you're generating a flow chart like this. And then you come back and you analyze it based on this Mason gain formula. And the Mason gain formula looks at, you know, calculations based on the number of closed loops you have and the number of open loops and the number of feedbacks you've got and all this kind of stuff. And you come up with some, some mathematics and you end up with the gain and input and output impedance. So what I did was I took this uh, model here, which is similar to what I'm doing, except it had a, a, uh, um, a bias resistor here. So I added in the bias uh, resistor. I modified this for the bias resistor. I modified the chart and the equations and I was able to do some calculations here and it worked out perfectly. If you compare the gain, again, it's giving negative, LT spice is giving me a magnitude, it's tracking perfectly. You look at the gain, it's like, it's pretty much bang on. You look at the input impedance compared to LT spice, again, it's tracking very well. You look at the output impedance, you know, compared to what LT spice, it's, it's pretty good. And here's a case where the input 
I, the only way I can make this work is I had to not terminate the input of the amplifier. If I terminated the input of the amplifier, this wouldn't work. So, you know, I left well enough alone and I left this alone. <laughs> it's, it's pretty cool, but uh, uh, it's very comp complicated. So that concludes the, the mid-band uh, analysis, the low frequency analysis where we're calculating the gain. So let's talk about how to calculate the 3 dB uh, frequency. So basically what you're doing, you're taking this model here and all we care about is what the input looks like and we're going to millerize this feedback uh, resistor and millerize the um, intrinsic capac capacitors. So if you look, it's as if you've got this. So you've got your RB, uh, your bias resistor. You know, this is the millerized uh, uh, feedback resistor. And here's uh, the gate to uh, source intrinsic uh, capacitance and the gate to drain uh, millerized uh, uh, capacitance. And so if you take those things and you do your calculations, you take the total uh, capacitance and you take the total resistance and you apply this formula here which is 1 over 2 pi times R equivalent C equivalent that gives you the 3 dB point at the input well at the output you also have capacitance here at the output as well so you do the very similar uh, calculation you millerize the um, uh, resistance the feedback resistance here uh, coming back, you millerize it, and I've got the calculations here how to do that. And same thing, you apply that. So you get two 3 dB points. And obviously, the lower one, the one that's going to be lower, is going to be the one that's going to be prevalent. That's going to get overwritten. So I took this, and I did my calculations, and I uh, checked it out. And so here's my calculation for the input. So... The FI is using the input side, and the FO is the output side. So you get two, and you can see one is a lot higher than the other one. So you use the lower one. Now, this didn't track very well with LT Spice. So again, this is something I scratch my head, and I'm going, what the hell? What is going on? And then LT Spice models. You go back to LT Spice models. If you look, first of all, you look at the data sheet, the data sheet does not specify anything to do with gate, drain, and source uh, internal resistances. Here it's showing the, the gate internal resistance is 3 ohms, the drain is 0, and the source is 0.75 ohms. It's pretty small. It's not making a big difference, but heck, it's there. The other thing, it's giving a range of the intrinsic gate to drain capacitance. It goes from maximum 80 peaks, uh, 80 puffs to uh, uh, 12 puffs. Now, if you look at the uh, data sheet, it's uh, it's giving you the input capacitance, out, output capacitance, reverse capacitance. You could do a calculation and you can arrive at what the um, uh, CGS and C, CGD is. They don't really line up and as well, if you look at the DC analysis, the, the operating uh, point, you know, the gate to source is using 50 picofarads, which is what's listed here. It's saying it's 50 picofarads. And the gate to drain, it's using 19.3 picofarads. But it's giving you a, a range here. So I, I scratched my head. So finally I said, you know what? I can create my own model. I took out all these resistances and I fixed the gate uh, to drain uh, a maximum to 19.3, just what was listed here, and 19.3, and I fixed it. And I said, okay, let me go back and do the calculations. And guess what? They matched. They came out. So the reason I wasn't getting this is because LT Spice is not doing a simplified calculation is what I'm doing. It's doing, in the background, it's doing a much more complex calculation calculation. Oops. Uh, so, okay. So that's how I calculated the uh, 3 dB uh, cutoff frequency and now high frequency analysis. So this is where, you know, you built your amp and you're saying, okay, hey, 
what's my gain going to be at 10 megahertz? What's my gain going to be at 20 megahertz? You know, uh, how do you get to that? So here's a very, very, very simplified way to give you an order of magnitude of what that is. Now, back in my first presentation, I said, uh, I had this slide up and I said, you know, the if you look at the Bode plot, the Bode or Bode or however you want to pronounce it, for this amplifier here, you see the amplifier rolls off at higher fre frequency. And it's telling you the gain at say 10 megahertz is here, it's about 14 dB, that's the gain. And at 100 megahertz, it's about zero dB, right? Well, that's not actually the gain. The gain of the MOSFET does not change. If the gain back here, you look to your mid band, your, your low frequency analysis, if the gain is say 35 dB, dB that's the gain of your MOSFET. It's, it's 35 dB. Out here, what's happening is your input gets shorted out because of the capacitor here. Normally, you're looking at the gain from your input to the output. If I was to look at the gain from the gate to my output, the gain would be flat. It would not change. But it's because we've got a voltage divider here. We've got this, this network here, um, and this here, it's a voltage divider divider. Think of this, this one, one resistor, this is another, but it's a, it's an impedance. It's not a resistor. So if you got one impedance here, you got another impedance here, it's a voltage divider. So what's actually happening is your input voltage is getting knocked down because of that voltage divider. And it's getting that 35 dB, dB of gain. But the net effect is you're seeing a much lower gain, gain from the input from V1 to V out. I hope that makes sense. So basically, if you look at your, your amplifier here and you sort of look at the Miller capacitances, here's the Millerized capacitance for the great gate to drain. Here's the drain to uh, the gate to source, and here's the gate to drain um, uh, uh, capacitance. So if you take a look at this, that's kind of like the two terms of a of a voltage divider. So in a classic voltage divider, you've got a, a resistor here, you've got a resistor here, and your voltage at the output is gonna be this divided by the sum coming out. So we could do the same thing with the feedback network here. We millerize the feedback uh, RF, we millerize that, and we millerize the uh, capacitances, and this forms our RA, so this is this impedance here is going to form RA, and this impedance here is going to form RB. And if we do this calculation, this is the gate voltage here is going to be the voltage here dropped by that factor there. So your output is going to be the gain, the, the non, the gain without feedback times the gate voltage here. So in, in essence, your gain is going to be the mid-band gain, the maximum gain, times this uh, divider, this voltage divider here. Now, this is a complex number. You can't just take magnitudes here. You have to take magnitudes and phases, and you have to do some complex math. So here's a spreadsheet where I have, I do all my complex calculations, and I plotted. Uh, this is for the no feedback case. So that's the case here where there's no feedback. And uh, here's the no feedback uh, gain. And I plot frequency. I look at my divider, this RA divided by RB, you know, um, and I look at my divider and I take what my gain is and I multiply it by my divider. And this is what I get. And, and this is what my calculation previously said was the 3 dB point. It was about uh, 4.5 megahertz. So sure enough, if you come down to 4.5 megahertz, the gain is about half. So it's around, it's between three to five megahertz. So somewhere around four, the gain drops to one half. 32 half of 32 is about 16. So it's somewhere in between there. So it tracks, it seems to be tracking okay. Now, if I go to LT Spice and I look at one megahertz, what's my gain? 
So this is my gain. Uh, I plotted this. I didn't do dv gain. I just did uh, linear. It's saying v because that's just LT spice saying that it's it's just a multiple. It's a number, and it thinks it's uh, volts, but it's not. It's a multiplication number. It's saying you've got a gain of 28 times. So it's saying at a one megahertz, I've got a gain of 28 times. And my rough calculations at one megahertz, I'm saying it's 26.6, it's about 27. So 27 versus 28, not bad, pretty good. So at 10 megahertz, uh, we go to 10 megahertz here, LT Spice is saying it's supposed to be 8.7, roughly about nine, uh, nine times gain, I'm getting about 10 gain with this rough primitive calculation, which is not too bad, it's pretty good. So. Now, if you look at it with 100 ohm feedback, so with the 100 ohm feedback, this is the mid-band gain. This is the gain I'm getting here. I'm getting 1.19. So now that divider is going to attenuate that down. So as I go down here, you'll see the divider is 1, 1, then finally gets to drop off here. So if I compare that to my uh, Analysis. Also, too, by the way, one other thing I should mention here, I don't think I mentioned it here. I should have mentioned it. Okay, this approximation only works here where it's linear. Okay, where it starts to taper off here and here, it's it's not going to apply because this is a linear approximation. So it's only going to apply here. And by the way, these turns, the way it flips around, that has to do with the poles and zeros. I think it's the, it's the poles that causes that change. Uh, I, I'm not a, a Hilbert transform person, so I don't know, but uh, I believe that has to do with the poles and zeros of this uh, uh, of the transform, the, the Hilbert transform. But what I'm looking at is just this area here. This applies. If you extend this out way out here, you know, this is going to extrapolate. Oops. This is going to extrapolate, and it's going to be off quite a bit. And that's why you go out to 50 megahertz, this value here is nowhere near what it's going to be because it's we, we've got some kind of a, a pole here that's causing it to um, uh, change its shape. So and uh, so comparing with 100 ohm feedback, uh, my rough calculation here. So I look at 10 megahertz. I should get a gain of about 1.2, you know, and at uh, 10. Megahertz, I'm getting a gain of one. So again, not too bad. So at 10 megahertz, at 100, that's 100 megahertz. Yeah, 100 megahertz. I should get a gain of about 0.7 uh, times. I'm tracking about 0.5. Again, not too bad. And that's because at 100 megahertz, it's probably not getting. It's I'm not. It's not very linear. Probably losing that linearity. So with a 1k feedback network, same thing. You know, you look at it at uh, 33 megahertz, should be 9.8. I'm getting 8.7, so I'm getting, you know, roughly about 9. I'm, should be 10. It's close. You know, uh, you look at the uh, at the uh, 3 dB frequency. Again, half of the uh, gain here should be 5. It's around in here, and it should be between 10 to 20 megahertz, which is... Or, uh, the calculation I did says it should be about 19 megahertz. So it's in there, so it's tracking not too bad. Uh, if we look at uh, 2930 megahertz, you know, uh, my rough crude calculation says it should be 3.9. I'm getting 3.6, 3.7. Not too bad. So that's a good way of just getting what it should be. Now, now I'm going to get into my world of hurt. So I'm going to look at some real-world uh, comparisons. Can you guys still hear me okay? Yeah, no problem. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the first thing I did was I built a, a uh, amplifier capable where I could change out resistors and change out things. And I used my scope initially to make measurements. And then I went back and I thought, let me try and use my, my uh, essay. And I used it and I got into a world of hurt doing that and I'll share with you my world of hurt. So what I wanted to do was compare, calculate what R in, R out gain and 3 dB cutoff frequencies were and compare it to what I measured. So here's the board I, I made. There's my socket where I would plug in different MOSFETs. 
here's the socket where I would plug in, you know, various uh, feedback uh, resistors. And I could put in different source resistors here. Here it's shorted out. And uh, my output here. So this is the input from a signal a generator. This is the output coming out. It's going to this board, which is basically sh have a load resistor going from, uh, um, from the signal to the ground. And then I've got a point here where I can attach my scope and I can measure the signal at the top of this uh, uh, load resistor here. So, okay, this is my, this is the start of my world of hurt. So uh, I don't have a choice. I have to use my scope to measure uh, the input signal, output signal to calculate load. Um, I, I don't know how to do that with a spectrum analyzer, how you could calculate your load, maybe look at some kind of 3 dB point, you know, but I use my scope to get the input and output uh, uh, impedances of the uh, amplifier. So to get the 3 dB frequencies, I initially used a scope and then I went back and I used the SA and I think I was really sloppy using the spectrum analyzer and I just got totally different values using the spectrum analyzer. So here are some observations here, and I'm going to, uh, next slide, I'll show you how stupid I am. But anyway, so I compared the measurements of 3 dB frequencies with my scope and SA, and they were off quite a bit, a times, two times. And that should give you, that should trigger something, two times. V squared, root two squared is two times. So anyway. But that should have been a trigger in my mind. So anyway, you know, I was getting quite a big difference between the SA and what I was measuring the 3 dB frequencies with the um, uh, spectrum analyzer and scope. And, you know, I would get uh, appropriate values for the spectrum analyzer mid-band analysis. And, you know, some of my measurements, the calculations differed significantly from what I actually measured. And this is why I'm coming back and I'm saying, you know, we we should have some kind of a round table where, where, where we talk about how to make RF measurements because I got bitten by this big time. And this is how stupid I am, okay? This is, <laughs> I'm not a very bright person. Okay, now, when measuring the 3 dB point, you're looking at half of the power, three, Minus 3 dB is one half of the power. So you look at the power level, you take half of that, and that's your 3 dB frequency. So you take your, your, your amplifier, look at the power level coming out, you, uh, you um, increase your, your signal frequency until that power drops to one half. Whatever frequency that is, that's your higher 3, 3 dB point. So I did that with the scope, but I used one half of the voltage, okay? Now, if you can't do that, you have to use root two. It's one over root two of the maximum output voltage. So it's 0 0.707, it's not 0 0.5 of the maximum output voltage, it's 0 0.707. And that corresponds to the half power point. So I only realized this today believe it or not. So that's how stupid I am. I did this, these calculations, you know, about a month ago, and I just figured this out today. So not very bright. So again, you know, coming back, one of the outcomes I'm hoping to come out of this presentation is that we should do some kind of a talk here about how to make measurements. Um, so I'm going to show you my data here. Um, so what I basically did, I took two transistors, two N7000 BS170. I calculated the gain based on my calculations, what LT spice and what I measured. Same thing for the 3 dB frequency, R in, R out. And what I quickly found out, the BS170 measurements, they were completely out, out to lunch. LT spice my calculations and what I measured completely out to lunch. And I had to take a step back and think about this because my BS170s, they were all transistors from China. Okay. And I have no idea whether they're close to the parameters on the data sheet and whether the LT SPICE model uh, corresponded to it. So 
I went and I looked at the LT Spice model for the BS170. And <laughs> take a look at this. So RG is the gate intrinsic resistance of this MOSFET. So according to this model here, it's telling me it's 270 ohms. 270 ohms. I look at all the other MOSFETs in the library, and they're all 1 to 3 to 0.5 ohms. If you look at the, the source in, intrinsic resistance here, it's 1.5. Drain is 1.4. This is 270 ohms. That's an error. That's a problem. So then if you take a look at the, the gate to uh, the drain maximum uh, capacitance, you know, it's saying it goes from 3 picofarads to, to 20 picofarads. So if I go to the data sheet and I take my input, output, reverse capacitance, and I convert those into uh, gate uh, to drain, gate to source, drain to source, you know, my CGD should be from 7 to 10 picofarads not 20 to 20 picofarads. So it's this is completely completely off off base. So I had to go back to my transistor tracer. I I pulled it out and I started looking at traces, calculating GM and calculating some things and my transistor tracer was showing me values that were completely different from this. So finally I just said, look, I'm not going to analyze the BS170. I just threw it aside. So this is how I only have a couple of slides left here. So this is my, my comparison. Instead of showing you numbers, I thought I would plot it. So what this is showing you, this is showing you for each of different feedback values. So this is the um, amplifier with no feedback with a 2.2K feedback resistor, a 1K feedback resistor, and a 200 ohm feedback resistor. Now the, the Blue trace is the calculated gain. That's the gain I calculated for my simplified model. The orange is what LT Spice shows. And uh, here it's that we're, we're looking at about 10 kilohertz. And then the, because this is mid-band gain, right? And the measured gain. So I took the amplifier and I measured the gain. Now, so I did this. There's three data points here. So right here showing you the data points for a 10K load, so the amplifier is loaded, 10K. Uh, here, the amplifier, these data points, there's a, a set of data points here for a 1K load, and then the third set of data points is for a 200 ohm load, and I just, I plotted straight lines between them just to show the trend. Now, you can't see the blue line here because it's superimposed. The LT Spice and my calculated gain are identical well, or close. They're extremely close. So if you look at the model, you could see a little bit of discrepancy between what LT Spice predicts and what I actually measured. Okay, and again, here it is. You're seeing a little bit here. It's more significant with, with no feedback and a large load. And uh, uh, here it is with 1K again, a little, little bit of discrepancy, but it's not too bad. You know, it's off, but it's, you know, it's a it's it's within the ball ballpark. So to me, I think this is good enough. But you know, it illustrates the point. Did I make these measurements properly? So here it is with the Z in. So uh, I'm comparing, you know, the input impedance with no feedback, 2.2, blah, blah, same thing, same exact thing. Here you could see a much greater discrepancy between what I measured and what I calculated, both LT Spice and uh, what I would my simplified calculations. But you could see they track pretty good. You know, in the case of with, a, with a lower, uh, with some level of feedback, you're, it seems to be tracking okay. So it's not too bad. So here, there's probably something wrong. Maybe it's my calculation, maybe it's my measurement. Uh, I didn't measure it properly, and that's why I'm getting these values off. But everywhere else, it seems to be tracking pretty good. So here it is for the output impedance. Again, not tracking well here. Seems to be tracking okay. So again, could be my, my measurement. But 
it's not too bad. It's given me a good order of magnitude. You know, it's certainly not telling me it's kilo ohms versus hundreds of ohms. It's telling me it's hundred ohms or it's you know fifty ish ohms, less than less than hundred ohms or you know between hundred to two hundred ohms kind of thing, which is not too bad. Now this is where it all craps down, craps out. My three dB calculations are there's like huge discrepancies here. If you look at with uh, 200 ohm feedback, huge, like 100 megahertz is what I've measured. And uh, the only reason why this thing tops out here is my um, signal uh, generator, the maximum output is 100 megahertz. So I couldn't go higher. And so it flat topped here. So it's something greater than 100 megahertz, but the calculation saying it should be 40 or 20 ish megahertz, you know, 30 ish megahertz here. And it's telling me uh, when I measure it, it should be 100 megahertz. Now, part of this could be that half power versus voltage problem, right? That I ran in, into. That could be part of this problem here. But again, it's coming back, you know, to this how to make RF measurements. And I, I'm hoping that this would uh, motivate us to have some kind of a round table to talk about measurements. So here, uh, I'm not going to go through this. It's just equation summary of uh, the equations I used. Here's the equations for three, three dB points, you know. And again, you take this as a ball ballpark here. And I think to get a much more better refined numbers for some of these things, I think we need, uh, I need to go and learn a little bit more. There's some more learning to be done here. But right now, it's not too bad. Um, you know, as a first order approximation, it's not too bad. Uh, key thing here, because your, your 3 dB frequency has a resistor term in it in the denominator, the smaller you make this term, the higher your frequency is going to be. So try and keep all your resistances as small as possible to allow uh, a higher 3 dB frequency to, to allow it to, to roll out. Or, or in other terms, you're just supplying more current. Okay, now I'm just gonna quickly show you this and then I'll stop. Um, this is what happens when you understand things. And quote me on this before I went insane from doing math. So what I did was I built this um, amplifier here uh, this um, uh, transmitter here, and basically what it is, it's an Ar Arduino Nano feeding an SI5351 that's feeding a signal out, and it's going through this, this gate driver, this uh, line driver here, and then that's feeding my MOSFET amplifier. Now, uh, the reason I'm doing this is these, these gate drivers, these drivers here, they're meant to reshaping a square wave. They take a square wave in, they reshape it, and they pump it out. And according to the data sheet, each one of these is capable of putting out about 4 milliamps and sinking about minus 4 uh, milliamps. And that's for output drive at 5 volts, which is what I want, because the SI5351 is putting out a TTL 5 volt signal. So what I thought I, I could do is I'll take all these, add the, add the, all the currents will add up, and so if it's giving me a maximum of 4 milliamps output, I've got 7 of them, I should get 28 milliamps going in, into this. The reason why I have to put this here is because notice they all have this little circle at the end. That's an inverting. So what happens, whatever, you put a positive signal here, it's a negative signal here. So I had to put one, uh, one of these amplifiers, one of these line drivers here to invert the signal because these are all going to invert it. So the net effect is I have a positive going signal here and I have a positive signal coming out. So it's in phase. So here's the board I, I made and there's the driver chip. It's taken out. So here I'm driving the MOSFET directly from the SI5351. And here it is at different frequencies. Here's the output in dBm, output in watts. And here, this uh, was was being fed to a low-pass filter. And so here's the highest harmonic in dBm and the harmonic attenuate, uh, attenuation uh, compared to the 
to the fundamental, it's minus 51, 50 dB down, so which is quite legal. Because in Canada, I think it's uh, 42 or 43 dB down. Uh, any spurious submission from the carrier needs to be. So now if I plug in the chip and I feed the signal through, and so I'm getting three times the current. Now I look at my output here and I'm getting much higher. If I look at the wattage, at 7 megahertz, I'm getting almost 2 watts. And at 30 megahertz, I'm getting 1 watt. Whereas before, I was not even getting half a watt. And at 7, I'm getting like just barely uh, 1 watt. So here, I'm getting at least 1 watt coming out right across, across the board. And I took this and I connected, sent CW connected to the reverse beacon network. I got picked up. It worked perfectly. So that's it.